Renee, can you hear me okay? I can. Great. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Will you just give me a thumbs up if you can see it when I oh. click share? I'm sharing now. Can you see it? All is well. All right, it's 12.01. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, Heshje Ishtongo, hello, how are you? Um, my name is Renee Stapp, and I am the um, Center Director for the VAST Center with the National Center for Victims of Crime. <clears throat> and we are so honored today to share space with you with um, our presenter today, Casey Ross. Um, Professor Ross is at OCU Law School right now overseeing the Indian Legals Program. If you have joined us previously, um, you know how wonderful she is, and um, we are really going to be mindful of our time today. Um, I also have our ASL interpreter, Melanie, here on scene because we want to make sure that we are honoring um, our relatives who can access language justice. Um, so we are always pleased to have her here to um, make sure we make that available to everybody. Um, this is our final series in our Vast Power Hour series. And like I said, we, um, we're, we're gonna be pretty free flowing today um, because it is a power hour. So we are going to try to keep this within the hour. So we'll do the best that we can to get questions answered at the end. But as usual, if not, we, we do welcome you to uh, put the Q and A's, uh, your questions in the Q and A section, and we will send a follow up to link all of the webinars, the Q and A's, the PowerPoints, the video. You will have access to everything once the series is complete. Um, and I already see people talking in the chat, so we love to see that. And also behind the scenes, we have Mariana Wells, who is the VAST program assistant, and she can help you within the chat. So if anything comes up, just drop it in the chat and she'll be able to uh, take that away. Uh, quickly, I just wanna do a quick land acknowledgement um, from where I'm coming from. And we would like to honor the ancestral homelands of the Kickapoo tribe of Oklahoma, the Absentee Shawnee tribe, and the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, known today as Choctaw, Oklahoma. So we honor the space that we're in with those um, ancestors who are walking with us today. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Casey and we're going to uh, kick this off today. All right, sounds great. Thanks so much, Renee, for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here for our third part of our series. Um, our presentation today is going to focus on gender based violence in Indian country. Um, before we get into the meat of the discussion, I want to issue just a few disclaimers. Um, first, my presentation does not necessarily reflect the views of the Office on Violence Against Women or the United States Department of Justice. Um, similarly, my presentation doesn't necessarily ref reflect the reviews of my employer, Oklahoma City University, or any of the tribal courts on which I serve. 
Um, I also want to take just a second to call out a more specific disclaimer, and that one is really related to my perspectives on this topic. Um, I've served as a, seagull, a civil legal attorney um, representing victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking in a variety of areas, in tribal courts, state courts. Um, I've also served as a victim's rights attorney, um, again, representing victims of crime, including children in tribal court and state court. Um, so please just be aware that my lens is going to be different than your lens. Um, my perspectives are going to be informed by my experiences, and I may be completely uninformed um, from the vantage point of your specific experience and perspectives. I just want to call that out and honor it. Um, finally, I do want to give a content advisory for the material we're going to cover together today. We're going to be discussing some very difficult topics um, and difficult content today. Um, that's going to include some descriptions of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. Um, please feel free to break from the discussion at any point um, to engage in your own self-care if the content becomes disturbing um, for your own health, your mental health, your emotional health. Um, and if someone you know or if you need help, um, please contact and reach out to um, a service provider for assistance. I'd like to thank um, the Victim Assistance to Support Tribes, VAST, which is a center of the National Center for Victims of Crime, for inviting me to participate in this series. Um, as you all are aware, VAST provides excellent resources, training, and technical assistance, um, and I appreciate the collective work of the team assembled here today for this webinar. So before we get started, um, let's just take a moment to remind ourselves of the previous webinars in this series. Our first webinar really focused on the Indian country definition post McGird. We talked through the rules for criminal jurisdiction in Indian country, and those were recently tinkered with, right, um, by the United States Supreme Court in the Castro Huerta decision. The rules we learned in that webinar are important to understanding some of what we're gonna cover today. So we're gonna anchor back to some of that content. Our second webinar focused on the Indian Child Welfare Act, specifically focusing on the intersection of that act with victimization and crime victims. So we're going to round out this series with a discussion on gender-based violence. And we really felt that October was a fitting time to hold this third and final Vast Power Hour webinar of 2022, since October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So let me tell you what you can plan for in today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is going to focus on a few things. Um, first, we're going to remind ourselves of some of the statistics and findings regarding violence in Indian country with a specific focus on those statistics that deal with domestic violence and sexual assault in Indian country. Um, second, we're going to spend some time talking through some of the legislative history surrounding the efforts that have been put into place to try to address some of those statistics. Then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking through the latest Violence Against Women Act reauthorization, including discussion of how the act enhances some protections for victims of, in Indian country. And then after that discussion, we're going to pivot a bit into a different approach than what we've done in our previous two webinars. Um, Renee Stapp and I are going to spend some time talking through some real life case examples from cases that we worked on together. And our goal for this segment of the webinar is to share our perspectives from our own vantage points to hopefully illustrate the need to collaborate across disciplines to address the unique needs of victims in Indian country. Um, we will end today just kind of thinking through some best practices for providing services to victims, given all that we've learned in, the, in this series. So let's start off reminding ourselves of some of the latest statistics um, regarding violence in Indian country. Um, more, than more than four in five American Indian and Alaska Native men and women, that's 83%, um, have experienced a form of violence in their lifetime. Um, physical violence, psychological aggression from an intimate partner, sexual violence, or stalking, okay? More than 1.5 million American Indians and Alaska Native women have experienced violence in their lifetime. Um, these statistics I'm giving you on this slide and the next come from a study published on the uh, Administration for Children and Families website. It's a, a citation to a National Institute of Justice study. Um, I also want to share these additional facts and statistics from that same report. Um, American Indians and Alaska Natives are 2.5 times more likely to experience violent crimes and at least two times more likely to experience rape or sexual assault compared to all other races. 
Homicide is the third leading cause of death among American Indian and Alaska Native women between the ages of 10 and 24, and it's the fifth leading cause of death for American Indian and Alaska Native women between the ages of 25 and 34. And in the United States and Canada, an average of 40% of the women um, uh, who were victims of sex trafficking identified as American Indian or Alaska Native. So these are some updated statistics. Those of you who do work in this space um, hear these statistics quite frequently. Um, just want to remind all of us of kind of the landscape that we're working to navigate with this discussion. Um, some ad additional um, statistics. <clears throat> pardon me, that are not shown on this slide, but that are taken from um, an, a recent report by Amnesty International. It's a report called The Never Ending Maze. Some statistics from that report that I wanted to share. Um, first of all, um, that report highlights the fact that the data that we do have as it relates to victimization in Indian country is largely unreliable and most probably underreports instances of gender-based violence in Indian country. Um, that uh, report also shares that uh, more than one in two American Indian Alaska Native women um, have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. Native women are 2.2 times more likely to be raped than non-Hispanic white women. Um, and the Amnesty International report also tells us that the intersection of gender-based violence and missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is heavily intertwined. And on some reservations, the murder rate of Native women is more than 10 times the national average. Yeah. So now that we've covered some of that horrific data and the statistics, let's focus just a bit on some of the criminal jurisdiction issues we discussed in our first webinar of the series and how those rules intersect with the content that we're going to be discussing today. So before 2010, the landscape for criminal jurisdiction in Indian country hadn't been changed much for several years before 2010, other than some Supreme Court cases here and there that answered questions that were kind of left in gray areas around those existing rules and principles. Now you will remember from our discussion in our first webinar, the Oliphant case. That case was decided by the United States Supreme Court in 1978. And in that case, the Supreme Court ruled that tribal courts have no criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. Um, the court's reasoning in that case was problematic um, from a jurisprudence perspective because the court kind of assumed that tribal courts shouldn't be allowed to exercise criminal power over non-Indians. Their reasoning seemed to circulate around this concept of fairness for non-Indian people who, despite committing crimes in a tribe's territory, might not be familiar with the tribal laws and procedures of that tribe. Um, I wanna take just a second to really try to fully process that logic. Um, Renee, can I call on you for just a second, ma'am? And you can just, you don't, even have, you don't even have to unmute yourself. You can just nod yes or no. So Renee, I am a citizen of the state of Oklahoma. Um, if I go into Kansas and I commit a crime, what court system is gonna prosecute me? Are you going into a tribal community in Kansas? No, yeah, no, I'm just hanging out in Kansas. Okay, so if you're just in Kansas on yeah. state land, state yeah. authorities can have jurisdiction over you. So Kansas, right? Kansas is going to prosecute me. Okay. Does it matter that I'm not a citizen of Kansas? Does it matter that I might not be aware of Kansas's laws or procedures? No. Yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't, right? So this Oliphant rule is really odd. It just feels odd. Um, and it severely limited tribes' abilities to address crime inside of their territories because there was this whole segment of the population, these non-Indians who couldn't be prosecuted by the tribal court. And what's really interesting, if you read the opinion, the Supreme Court, even in its own opinion, right then in 1978, recognized that the prevalence of crimes committed by non-Indians on reservations was concerning. And the court invited Congress to weigh in on the matter. Um, tribes and other advocacy organizations immediately began advocacy to have a law passed by Congress to fix that Oliphant decision. But no holistic statute has ever been passed, um, even to this day. Another limitation um, imposed on tribal court authority originated in the Indian Civil Rights Act, and that was passed 10 years before Oliphant was even decided. The Indian Civil Rights Act is much like the United States Constitution's Bill of Rights, um, but it doesn't prohibit um, tribal governmental establishment of religion, and it also doesn't require the provision of counsel for indigent defendants. 
but it does put into place protections for folks in tribal court. Um, one of these protections is a limitation on tribal authority where tribal courts can only impose sentences up to a $5,000 fine and a sentence of no more than one year in prison. So as you can see, this original version, which was passed in 1968, limited tribal court authority in a significant way. Um, throughout the legislative history of this statute and after its passage, tribes and organizations consistently advocated for fewer restrictions on tribal court operations, and those efforts continue even to this day. Now, we're going to spend just a bit of time talking through congressional statutes that have been aimed to address the problems that are created by the Indian Civil Rights Act and Oliphant. But I just want to be really clear that tribal advocacy to recognize the inherent power of tribal courts has been ongoing throughout all of this history that we're going to be discussing. Um, advocacy efforts have included advocacy for an Oliphant fix, again, to get rid of that Supreme Court created rule that told tribal courts they couldn't prosecute on Indian defendants. Advocacy has also surrounded an ICRA fix to remove those restrictions and limitations on tribal courts' ability to punish criminals, um, among, other, among other asks, right? So let's talk about some of the statistics that really developed as a result of the advocacy efforts. Um, in 2010, which was before the Tribal Law and Order Act was passed and signed, and well before the Violence Against Women Act 2013 reauthorization, which we'll talk about here in just a few moments, the Government Accountability Office conducted some deep dive research into crime and victimization in Indian country. So in that report, it covered the span of years between 2005 and 2009, and the GAO found that there were about 10,000 Indian country matters that had been referred to United States attorneys offices for further effort. Um, 9,000 of those 10,000 were considered resolved. And when we say resolved, one of three things happened. Either the case was filed for prosecution, the case was administratively closed, or the United States attorney declined to prosecute the case, okay? When we talk about those 9,000 that had been resolved, 77% of those referrals were categorized as violent crimes, but 52% of those declined to prosecute. 24% um, were categorized as nonviolent crimes, 40% of those declined to prosecute. So when we think holistically about those 9,000 cases, that universe, the United States Attorney's offices declined to prosecute at least 50% of those 9,000 cases. In some areas, it was less, in some areas, it was more, um, geographically speaking, but overall about 50% of those cases were declined to be prosecuted. And what was really interesting, if you read that GAO report, you can find it online, it's a PDF, and you can pull it right off the government's website. Um, if you read that report, what's really interesting is you see that report kind of trying to hash through a variety of different systems where law enforcement agencies weren't um, consistently from one area to another referring cases for prosecution weren't consistently collecting evidence there were just a whole lot of hiccups and problems and inconsistencies with um, different agencies trying to uh, put these cases forward for prosecution right so you see the very high declination rates for cases that were referred um, for federal prosecution and the gao really wanted to understand why so many cases were never prosecuted so this slide um, shows from the U.S. Attorney's electronic filing system why cases were not prosecuted. So you'll see on this slide, 42% of them were declined because there was weak or insufficient evidence um, that was admissible. 18% um, no federal offense was evident. 12% we've got witness problems. 10% um, lack of evidence of criminal intent. 10% suspect is going to be prosecuted by other authorities and then other reasons for declination 26% so you really start to get a feel for how this was working out boots on the ground with all of these cases um, just ending up not being prosecuted right by the United States Attorney's Office. I want to take a second here and just call something out because I don't in any way want to come across as being um, hostile or unfair to the United States Attorney's offices or to any of the law enforcement officers who work um, across this country, particularly in Indian country, because the resources that were in place 
really weren't sufficient for the robust type of presence that you would need to see inside of Indian country. So in no way, shape or form am I bagging on um, our federal officers or our federal prosecutors. Um, frankly, you know, they had a whole lot of um, a whole lot of problem surrounding just a lack of resources and a lack of infrastructure to address these these needs as well. So um, in response to all these years of advocacy, and in an effort really to address the statistics that the GAO report really uncovered, um, Congress passed, my, my apologies, Congress passed um, the Tribal Law and Order Act. Um, this act is an amendment to the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968, and it allows tribal courts to enhance sentences, to impose up to three years for each offense, so long as the total term in prison doesn't exceed nine years and also empowers tribal courts to levy fines that are between $5,000 and $15,000 per offense. So those sentencing limitations that we talked about in the original Indian Civil Rights Act from 1968, those are increased as a result of the 2010 Tribal Law and Order Act. Now, I need you to please understand that these enhanced sentencing provisions only apply if the defendant has been previously convicted of the same or comparable offense by any jurisdiction in the United States, or if the defendant's being prosecuted for an offense comparable to an offense that would be punishable by more than one year of imprisonment if that case were taken up and prosecuted by the United States or any of the other states, right? So it's not just kind of a blanket authorization, hey, tribes, you automatically have this authority to enhance your sentencing. It's only for a specific type of case. Please also understand that those enhanced sentencing options don't automatically apply to all tribes. Only tribes that comply with the requirements on this slide are eligible to engage in that enhanced sentencing. So in order to impose enhanced sentencing, tribes have to provide a defendant uh, effective assistance of counsel, provide an indigent defendant, a defense attorney, require that the presiding law is law trained and is licensed to practice in any jurisdiction in the United States. Let me pause right there. Um, not all tribal courts require that their tribal court judges be law trained. They don't all say, hey, to be a judge in our court, you have to have gone to an ABA accredited law school. They don't all say, hey, you have to pass a state bar exam. Not all tribal courts have that law trained requirement for their um, judiciary. So if you want to engage in this enhanced sentencing, Tribal Law and Order Act says, hey, your judges need to be law trained and they need to be licensed to practice law in a jurisdiction within the United States. In addition, tribes have to make all of their criminal laws and their evidence rules and criminal procedure rules publicly available. Um, and for this enhanced sentencing option, tribes have to keep a recording of proceedings, either an audio or a video recording. Okay, so if I could just kind of sum up quickly, the Tribal Law and Order Act um, as an effort to address these high rates of crime and high rates of declination to prosecute folks committing crimes in Indian country. Um, it, if we're talking about if we're talking about what the tribal courts options are, hey, tribal court, if you want to impose these enhanced sentencing, you can do so only for certain types of cases and only if you comply with all these requirements. So this narrowly tailored remedy offered by the Tribal Law and Order Act in a lot of instances proves to be just too burdensome and too expensive for a whole lot of tribes. Um, the most recent statistics that I've seen indicate that 10 years, right, 10 plus years after passage of the Tribal Law and Order Act, fewer than 20 tribes of our country's 570 plus have actually opted in to these enhanced sentencing options under the Tribal Law and Order Act. Um, I also want to just note that the Tribal Law and Order Act also imposed some additional requirements on U.S. attorneys offices and federal law enforcement entities. Um, it established some infrastructure for those federal offices and also authorized some federal funding to support those services in Indian country. And those are all good things and they have proven to be helpful um, over the years. So I should note um, that as the Tribal Law and Order Act was moving its way through Congress for passage, there was really this hard push advocacy to install an oliphant fix in that statute, right? Um, tribal leaders advocated through their own testimony for congressional language that recognized tribal inherent authority to prosecute all crimes committed inside of their ter territory, even if those crimes were committed by non-Indian people. So the Tribal Law and Order Act was passed without an oliphant fix, but the advocacy work continued. And that really brings us to the 2013 Violence Against Women Act reauthorization. For the first time, we see a congressional fix 
which I categorize as really just kind of a partial oliphant fix um, for very specific and limited purposes. So under the 2013 Violent Violence Against Women Act reauthorization, um, tribes could elect to prosecute non-Indians for crimes committed inside the tribe's territory if, if the perpetrator committed a specific type of crime. So the types of crimes um, that tribes could prosecute non-Indians for committing were limited, right? They were limited to domestic violence crimes, dating violence crimes, or violations of protective order. And only when the defendant either resided or worked inside the tribe's territory, or the defendant was a spouse, an intimate partner, or dating partner of a member of the tribe, or any Indian who lived inside the tribe's territory. So in other words, a tribe could prosecute a non-Indian for one of these crimes if the non-Indian defendant had some ties to the territory, right? But again, in order to um, engage in this special domestic violence jurisdiction, tribes really had to check all the boxes before being kind of approved to exercise the jurisdiction, right? So we, we see in the 2013 reauthorization that tribes had to, first of all, provide all those same protections that were listed in the Tribal Law and Order Act, and also, you know, just doubling down, making sure the instructions were really clear in the act itself, provide the defendant effective assistance of counsel, provide an indigent defendant a defense attorney, requiring the training, uh, the, law, the law training for their judges, um, criminal codes, records, etc. So we still see kind of this list of things that you have to check off um, for tribes who wanted to opt into that special um, domestic violence prosecutorial authority. Now, again, these requirements have proven to be pretty onerous and too expensive to implement for a whole lot of tribes. Um, the latest statistics I've seen um, indicate that only around 30 of our 570 plus federally recognized tribes have fully implemented this special VAWA um, jurisdiction. I do anticipate that that number is going to increase, um, but there really needs to be some additional funding to assist tribes with that type of implementation. So that brings us to the latest Violence Against Women Act reauthorization um, in 2022. Again, this act is a response to the statistics and the data that we've already covered together today. Um, the, 22, the 22 VAWA reauthorization um, does add to the list of crimes tribal courts can prosecute non-Indian defendants for committing inside of Indian country. That list now also includes sexual assault, child abuse, sex trafficking, um, and assaults on tribal law enforcement officers. The 2022 reauthorization also increases um, services for LGBTQ plus survivors and also creates a civil cause of action um, for the disclosure of intimate visual images. Now, let's also just remind ourselves, as we discussed in our first webinar of this series, that the recent Supreme Court case, Castro Huerta, has created a situation where potentially three sovereigns have the authority to prosecute a non-Indian defendant for committing one of these offenses inside of Indian country, right? We've got federal authority, tribal authority, and state authority. Just as a reminder um, of what we learned in our first webinar series, the federal government is going to have authority to prosecute a non-Native defendant for committing a crime inside of Indian country when the victim's Native. And that authority comes from 18 U.S.C. 1152, which governs interracial crimes. The state government may also have the authority to prosecute that non-Indian for committing a crime inside of Indian country when the victim's native if the exercise of state jurisdiction isn't preempted. And then the tribal government may have authority to prosecute the non-Indian for committing a crime inside of Indian country if the case is one authorized for tribal prosecution under VAWA, but again, only if the tribe is a participating tribe in special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction. So at this point in our time together, we're going to pivot into a little bit of a new direction. But before we do that, I want to be sure to plug an event that might be of interest to many of you, particularly my attorney colleagues that are in attendance today. On October 14th, the Oklahoma Indian Bar Association is hosting a CLE that's going to last from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. And the title of the CLE is Indian Country Jurisdictional Update, Castro Huerta and VAWA 2022. Um, for those of you who would like a deeper dive into the legal aspects of what we've already just briefly covered today, that CLE may be a great fit for further learning. Um, Mariana is going to drop a link to the event in the chat um, in case you'd like to check it out. And if you use the promo code discount, you can get $25 off the cost of registration. 
So we have covered just so much information in our time together over these past three webinars, um, and every single bit of the material that we've covered together is important, right? We've talked through the Indian country definitions and really work to understand the differences between reservation based communities and allotment based communities and how McGirt, you know, kind of clarified what um, that definition of Indian country looks like in specific areas, including Oklahoma. Um, we've also spent some time learning the criminal jurisdiction rules um, for Indian country prosecutions. Um, we've we've spent some time um, thinking through Indian child welfare issues, um, talking today about tribal law and order act and violence against women act prosecutions. Every single one of these topics kind of layers onto itself and it layers onto the other topics and it just forms this web of systems and resources that have to be engaged to fully provide the needed services for victims. And when we're working in Indian country, we really have to have a pretty good understanding of all of these aspects to meet the challenges that are unique and that face Native victims. So before we open it up for some Q&A, I want to take just a little bit of time to interact on the screen with my wonderful colleague and friend Renee Stapp. Um, Renee and I have known each other and worked together for nearly 20 years. Um, when I was a baby lawyer, um, Renee was the first victim's advocate I worked with, and I learned a lot from her and we learned a lot from each other just working through cases together. So we're going to talk through some of those experiences for just a few minutes with the goal of demonstrating how collaboration can serve the needs of victims. I'm gonna just share my perspective um, as an attorney and Renee will share her perspective as the victim's advocate in each of these instances. Um, I should also note that in addition to having decades of experience as a victim's advocate, Renee also has enjoyed a career in law enforcement. So her lens is really unique, her perspective's unique and her abilities to navigate multiple systems are truly, truly valuable. Um, again, before we get started kind of examining these case studies, I wanna give a content advisory. Again, these, these cases do involve crime and, and crime victims, so please disconnect um, should interacting with this content become difficult for you. Renee, are you ready to visit with me a little bit? Um, Renee, uh just lost power, so she's gonna okay. call and dial in. So if you wanna start, um, okay. I'll, I'll communicate with you through the okay. chat and let you know. No worries. No worries. Thanks, Mariana. Um, Thank so you. the first case I want to talk about just really briefly, um, let me get my screen situated. Okay, thanks. The first case I want to share with you all just really um, briefly was a domestic sexual assault case. Um, in this instance, my client was um, sexually assaulted by her estranged husband and my client was seeking a divorce. Um, at the time of this case, Renee and I were working together under a grant program. And when we wrote the grant, we said, wouldn't it be super cool if we required that in every single civil legal case we file under this grant, the attorney is required to work with a victim's advocate. We just thought that was a, you know, kind of cutting edge idea. So it was a requirement of the grant that every attorney working a case that was funded for, for that, through that grant, every attorney needed to work with a victim's advocate and work jointly on the case. And I really thank goodness that that was a requirement um, because it, it, really, it really made an impact for this particular client. So I get you know the phone call from the client in the morning hours and I complete my intake with the client pretty quickly. Um, and I just haul off and prepare all of the things to file that day, right? Um, I, pr I prepare a divorce petition and I request sole custody and I request uh, child support and the whole deal. Um, I prepare an emergency protective order. Um, I prepare um, additional filings for protection. Um, I just was ready to haul myself over to the courthouse and file a number of things. I thought while I was there, I might just pop into the district attorney's office as well and make sure that they're right on top of uh, filing the criminal charges that I felt like they needed to be filing that day as well. Um, I had every single thing printed. I had it all signed. I had arranged for service of process and I was just on my way to the courthouse and I thought, oh yeah, 
that grant program requires that I work with a victim's advocate. I'm going to call Renee. I'm going to call Renee and just let her know what I'm doing. I'm sure she's going to love every single bit of it. So I call Renee. Keep in mind, y'all, I've been out of law school for maybe three years at this time. So bless my heart. I really thought I was a lot more talented than I actually was, right? I call Renee and with my most lawyerly voice, I inform her of every single bit of my proactivity. I actually, to be honest, I expected that she was going to tell me how proud she was of me and how great I did. Um, so I get on the phone with her and I walk her through all the things that I'm planning to file and how, you know, the defendant's going to be served with this and that, and this and that today. Um, I finish going through my little spiel and Renee very calmly, but very seriously says to me, Casey, if you go file all of those things today, you're going to get her killed. What she said, you're going to get your client killed. And it was so shocking to me because as a lawyer, I had been trained um, to be aggressive. I had been trained to be um, proactive. I had been trained to be prepared. And I really believed that I was doing all of the right things for my client. And only after Renee educated me, did I really start to understand that this area of practice as a lawyer is so much more high stakes and so much different than any other type of civil litigation you could ever dream of, right? Um, Renee talked me through lethality risk assessment. Um, she talked me through safety planning. Um, she really encouraged me to slow down, to work strategically, to work methodically, and to do every single step of every single case in lockstep with an informed victim's advocate. Um, and it was such an eye-opening experience for this baby lawyer who thought she knew what she was doing and had to be um, called into uh, appropriateness by the victim's advocate who knew far more than I did about the needs of this specific victim. Renee, are you back with us? Can you hear now? I'm here. Hooray! Um, I am here, but I cannot, I cannot get on the panelist link, I don't think. I've turned on my video, but I don't see me, so I don't know which link I'm on. I'm sorry, I just completely lost power. So I see um, you. I so see I, you, I, Renee. So I'm assuming that everyone else can see you because I do see you now. OK, well, I chimed in just in time because Renee. I wanted to take that. I wanted to take that back to one of the things that you first said about how you were looking at this from a different lens. And not only um, were we looking at it from different disciplines, but also culturally. Because Casey's Cherokee and I'm Muscogee Creek, so we have a little bit difference in the way our court systems do things, so we have different experiences uh, coming to serve that victim. And just to be cognizant as, and I think it's like this with everybody, advocates very, um, this is my victim, we get very protective, right? And attorneys are like, this is my case, and law enforcement are like, this is my call. And the, the key is making sure advocates are the best untapped resource that you have for attorneys, cops, uh, professors, teachers, I don't care who you are. If you are not coordinating with advocates to better understand a trauma-informed response, barriers to victims of gender-based violence, um, you are doing a disservice from the get-go. So partner with your advocates at every avenue. And even if you do not think that what an advocate is telling you is like going to work for you in court, um, do not go to court. Postpone it, sit down, have those conversations because it's imperative that everybody's on the same page because at the end of the day, it's about the victim. It's not about your case. It's not about our client. It's not about that call. It's about the victim and victim autonomy and what they want to see happen. It, I really just think, I, I think it was like, you know, divine intervention that Renee was placed um, in, in in my life at that time, but I think more importantly in the victim's life at that time, um, because I, I was just a brand new lawyer, right? And I thought I knew something. Um, but one thing I just always really appreciate about working with Renee was she was not shy to tell me, hey, stop what you're doing right now. Let's talk about this. Let's think about this. She was not shy. And um, I, I think, I, I mean, I have, I have experienced other situations where 
um, other service providers or other victims advocate might be a little deferential to the lawyers thinking, oh, well, that's the lawyer. So the lawyer clearly knows what the lawyer is supposed to be doing. And I'm here to tell you, uh, uh, don't ever assume that the lawyer knows what the lawyer's doing. I mean, the victims advocates, from my perspective, um, are really the most valuable um, team members in a multidisciplinary approach for addressing the needs of victims. So if I can just give um, some unsolicited advice to any victims advocates on the screen today, um, don't be too deferential to your lawyers. Don't be too deferential to court staff. Don't be too deferential to judges because I'm promising y'all, you know a whole lot more um, than most lawyers who are, who are doing this work. Um, Renee, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking through another um, case study. Um, if that's okay with you, we'll move on to the next one. Sure. Um, the next one um, is, is a pretty interesting one as well. Um, this one I call the courthouse caucus um, because it was just one of those things you can't make up. And if Renee wasn't on the screen with me, you'd probably think I was making it up. Um, so in this instance, the victim really needed civil legal assistance. Um, we had gotten an emergency protective order. We were set for hearing um, on the longer term order and we were preparing on her divorce. Um, as far as I understood, Everything was going according to plan, right? So one day, Renee and I went together to the courthouse and we were just going really to check in with the judge's office to set a different hearing um, in the divorce action. And I open up the door, walk into the judge's office and out walks my client. She's just walking smooth out. It was just by the grace of God that we showed up at that moment. And I was really surprised to see her, right? I said, what, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I came to the judge's office. I really think we need to just drop the protective order. And I think we need to delay the divorce action. Um, my husband's mom reached out to me and she visited with me. And after I heard from her, I just kind of feel badly for putting him through this. Um, I, as the lawyer, had a response that was not going to be helpful. It was not going to, I'm just telling you, it was not going to be helpful. I was, um, I was, I, I guess I was angry. I don't know how else to put it. I was frustrated, right? Um, before I could even respond, you know, Renee just immediately intervened. Um, she took the victim aside um, sat the victim down on a bench. And I just kind of hands off, walked away and let Renee um, have her conversation that she needed to have with that victim. Um, by the end of the conversation, um, the victim really did have her strength back. I don't know how else to put it, Renee. I think she just had her strength back after having a conversation with you and things were able to proceed um, as we had planned. Do you remember that day, Renee? I do remember it. And I think, you know, it's it's not that I did anything special. I, it's I had a really good relationship with that victim. And, and that's another key part. Like a lot of times when uh, and we learned a lot from this. So in the beginning, like I would do all the work and then Casey would come in and save the day in court. And we found that that was a great response, but it wasn't the best response. So the best response was to also build that relationship with the victim and, and Casey so that our next few cases became a joint conversation with everybody instead of me just having this conversation. So, you know, I just, I just listened to the victim about what it was that was happening and, you know, acknowledged her feelings and then reiterated the plan that we had in place and how this was going to be, um, the most protective scenario for her kids um, because that was her biggest concern. And of course, mother-in-law was really playing on that, you know, as my grandkids and, and, you know, the fault and the blame that everybody, the blame game everybody does with the victim. But what we learned from that was it would have been more helpful for Casey and I to have done that prior to have that build that rapport together, which we started to do because, hey, that's how you learn. You fall on your face, you, you get up and you say, how can we do it better next time? And we really worked through some some cases with some phenomenal, um, strong women warriors um, that made us a really good team. Yeah, and that, that case specifically, I mean, I remember, um, I remember being frustrated and I remember you, Renee, again, calling me into compliance, um, saying, you're not allowed to get frustrated. 
that's not what you're here to do and really talking me through how my mind should be processing this information and processing this unexpected hiccup. Um, and I do feel like um, after that surprise court, courthouse caucus, um, we did, you know, get a, a much closer relationship with, you know, three folks instead of, you know, two um, uh, on one at a time. But um, in that in that case, I want to just also mention another thing that happened, because, again, you can't make this stuff up. We cannot make it up. So uh, we go to court um, on the protective order hearing and uh, the victim's there, ready, prepared, doing a great job, ready to go in front of the judge and explain why she needs this longer term protective order. Um, she goes down to her car and on her windshield are some roses and a note. Um, were they roses, Renee, or it was something? It was a note and flowers, I remember. They were daisies, I think, because it was her favorite Daisies, flower. daisies. Okay, got daisies. it. Um, and the uh, the defendant was um, texting her, saying, hey, I left you something on your car. So when she comes up and kind of reports to us what's going on, this is where Renee's law enforcement experience um, really came into, um, it was just really, really handy. Um, but Renee looked up and down the hall and there were a couple of sheriff's deputies hanging out in the hall and Renee said, come here, fellas. And so they came over and she kind of just told them what was going on, said that, you know, our victim was scared. I mean, she was scared because he was, he knew where she was. He knew where her car was parked. He, you know, I mean, it was, it was one of those scary situations. Um, we go into the courtroom, um, the judge is seated. And when um, she asks folks to enter their appearances on that specific case, when um, when the batterer stood up, um, the sheriff's deputies arrested him immediately in front of the judge during a live um, protective order hearing, right? Um, again, something we would never, we would never, I don't think anyone would believe this story, Renee, if we weren't both here saying, yep, totally happened. But the judge was not happy. The judge was not happy about it at first. She was mm -hmm. not happy that her courtroom, and she was a, this was a phenomenal judge. This is one of those judges you want to get in uh, domestic violence cases. And she was not pleased that her courtroom was disrupted in this manner without having information. Yeah. But then when she um, heard what occurred, um, when she understood that he violated an emergency order, it was really hard for him to say he shouldn't be subject to a more permanent order, right? Um, yeah. But it was, it was just one of those situations and you know when you tell a story like that you can think of the ways that it could have gone and how it could have made someone feel but i'm telling you in that particular instance my client felt really supported felt really safe and felt like um, all of the systems were working together in real time the way that they're supposed to um, to keep her safe and it was a really good demonstration of um, kind of a collaborative effort um, Renee and I have also worked on a bunch of different cases that involve um, Indian child welfare issues, and I wanted to take a moment just to talk about some of those because I think it's helpful, particularly to anchor back to our second webinar in this series. Um, Renee, could you spend just a couple of minutes talking through the importance of understanding the Indian Child Welfare Act and working with ICW offices um, as you're serving the needs of victims? Absolutely. So we know that um, anytime there's um, ICWA action, there's there's some kind of court or intervention by state folks, and they're not always informed, culturally informed about the act. They may know bits and pieces, but they don't know that. And I really found and took the responsibility as a Native woman to try to be that voice for those moms, dads, and for the children to educate state judges. And Casey has bailed my behind out in more contempt threats from judges um, than any attorney friend I have. But the fact of the matter remains that not all, probably the majority of state court judges, state district attorney's office, state attorneys, um, state DHS workers, they do not understand ICWA as a whole. And as Native people, I think we kind of take that for granted because that's what we know, that's what we grew up with. So in order, I mean, I've, I'm not going to go as far to make excuses and say that it's not handled appropriately because there are jurisdictions, it's just, it's too much to understand, so we're just going to do it the way we're going to do it. But I took on that responsibility myself 
often, it is imperative that you are educating the people in your community about ICWA so that our children are protected. Um, because we know due to our jurisdiction complexities, the chances of us having those interminglings with those agencies, it's going to happen. So educate, educate, educate. And I, I've also just seen such great um, outcomes when we talk about different aspects of the system being on the same page and understanding what's actually going on in a family's home, right? Um, decisions are oftentimes made, again, with that really myopic focus in one area because the person who's looking at it is only looking at it through a particular lens. And so to see, you know, um, victims advocates working with ICW offices, um, I've seen it just really improve, vastly improve outcomes in both cases, right? Not just the um, child welfare case, but also um, the domestic violence issues um, that are facing the victim. So again, I think you're exactly right, Renee, but that collaboration is just super, super important. I think we're probably ready um, just about to turn this over to Mariana to facilitate some of the question and answer portion. Um, I really just want to thank everybody for joining us um, on this webinar series. We obviously hope that the information provided has been helpful um, in gaining a better understanding of the complicated legal frameworks that victim, victims have to navigate that go across every system, several systems at the same time. Um, I do really appreciate the opportunity to work with Renee and with others um, who have cultural competency and have cultural awareness because the needs facing Native victims really are unique. Um, and I truly believe that working, you know, with a lot of different folks from a lot of different perspectives um, results in those best outcomes for victims. So thank you so much to BAST for hosting this series, series and I'll hand it over to Mariana for um, our question and answer period. Hi, thank you guys so much. That was such an amazing webinar. Very bittersweet. Um, to see how much everybody has learned and where we've gone. So we have a bunch of questions pouring in. Um, as uh, I see some people are dropping them in the chat, we don't wanna miss them. So please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, let's start off with, uh, when working directly with these individuals and the trauma that was directed to them and their family, do you advocate for the family to receive counseling? Oh, can I take that one? So um, interesting, we just had this conversation in Alaska um, a couple weeks ago. So I am a huge fan. I've been doing this for 20 years and I am a huge fan of victim autonomy. And I do think that counseling or whatever healing journey a victim takes is absolutely helpful to their overall well-being. However, if it is not the victim's choice to participate in counseling, I'm going to honor that for whatever reason may be. Because if somebody is not at a stage that and they're ready to attempt that, it's not gonna be beneficial. And it can almost mitigate the need for something like this. So um, it's kind of a two-part two part answer. Like, yes, I probably would do that if that's where the victim is in that moment. But uh, again, victim autonomy and counseling may be different for each victim. It may be something cultural. It may be something one-on-one -on -one with a local elder. It may not be the Western um, beha behavioral health counseling or, you know, that we're used to. So I think you need to be very cognizant of that so that we're not re-traumatizing victims and making sure that we're not making this our journey. It's their journey and we should be humble and honored to walk along that with them and listen to their needs and wants. Casey, anything to? No, I mean, I, I think that's I think that's a perfect question for Renee to answer again because she's got a more multifaceted lens um, than I'm going to have. You know, when when I think of you know accessing resources for counseling, if it's something that the victim's advocate um, would recommend, then obviously um, I have an interest in making sure that any services that are provided are culturally appropriate services um, for our victim and our victim's family. Um, and that that is that's something that doesn't just immediately make itself apparent to folks a lot of times. And so um, we all have to really be on the same page about identifying those resources, 
steering people towards those resources, um, again, to make sure that we've got culturally competent people engaging in those discussions, because it's just very different. It just is. Absolutely. So our next question is, do you have recommendations for advocates and tribal protective services who work with victims and survivors to best collaborate and provide services for mutual victims? Renee, you want to take a crack at that one, too? Sure. Um, so wait, where'd the question go? Let me see. Okay. Um, so the recommendations is, I will tell you that we started a community, a coordinated community response, very informal. Um, when I worked at the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, it was very informal. We did donuts and coffee. Um, and it started out with like eight people. Um, there was myself, another advocate, one police officer. We had um, a, an ICWA worker. And because we started really doing good work and, and just kind of staffing cases, um, that turned into like 30 people committing to meeting monthly from the only people that we didn't have were state judges, but we did have tribal judges who began showing up. So my best recommendation is start small with a group of like-minded people that you can start opening conversations up about best practices for your community. Because the one thing about Indian country, you can't cookie cut it. So what we did at the Potawatomi Nation did not work at the Seminole Nation. We had different resources, we had different judges, we had different court systems. Um, so we, we started one in Seminole Nation territory, but we had to do that differently because it was a CFR court versus a tribal court. So that's, that's the best advice I can give you. Start small and just start with like-minded folks who wanna invoke change. And the only thing I would add to that is to the extent that you all pull legal counsel in to participate in um, providing services to victims, make sure um, that the attorney is being mindful of attorney client privilege and engaging um, with other service providers in a way that doesn't in any way, um, you know, subject them to being called as a witness um, in, a, in a bad situation where that really shouldn't be occurring. So. Um, feel free to always give that nudge, give that reminder and say, hey, lawyer, I have some concerns about attorney client privilege. Let's talk about the meets and bounds of what I'm going to do um, just to just to protect the integrity of the case. And in those meetings, just to be clear, in those meetings, we didn't talk specifically about people. We used the cases to talk about incidents. Now, the people that were involved directly in the case generally knew who we were talking about, but we never, confidentiality was always at the forefront. So when we would discuss a case, it would be just the meats and the potatoes, like what was going on, not the individuals. I bet we have time for one or two more questions, Renee. Mariana, anything else? Yeah, we have one. Um, uh, uh, this is the direct question. Um, does it also include a non-tribal member? I'm aware of a violent crime that occurred on the Navajo Nation, but the person couldn't be prosecuted because he was a member of another tribe. Okay, so when we talk about tribal authority to prosecute, tribes have authority to prosecute native defendants period regardless of what tribe that native defendant is a member of so it doesn't matter if that person's not navajo that person can still be prosecuted by the navajo nation so long as that person's native okay um, that comes to us um, as a result of the duro fix if y'all remember from our first webinar the supreme court they issued a decision in the Duro case. They said tribes shouldn't have authority to prosecute non-member Indians. And then Congress came back the very next year and went, Supreme Court, you got that wrong. Tribes should have authority to prosecute all native people regardless of their tribal citizenship status. So um, absolutely tribes have authority to prosecute all native people regardless of their tribal affiliation. I think what she was saying, um, the person was uh, asking because the person was a non-tribal member. So the crime occurred on the Navajo Nation, but the person couldn't be prosecuted because he was a member of another tribe. And just to be clear, Casey stated, and it's true, they do have the sovereign inherent power to prosecute that individual. However, tribal codes 
and tribal law is going to dictate how that tribal court and tribal law enforcement respond to crime. So if the Navajo Nation has a code, and it could be a specific code in one of their many communities, not the entire reservation, that states we will only prosecute uh, Navajo tribal members. So again, you can't cook it Indian country, and it's going to be extremely different everywhere you go. So let's, uh, we got one more. Um, where do we find information on ICWA? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a pretty great website, um, the National Indian um, Child Welfare Association, and they have a lot of resources um, that are just free and available and good links there. Um, I also think it's a great idea to just seek out um, any additional training on Indian child welfare issues. Um, it's a, it's a pretty specific area of the law, but I find that there are at least, you know, a handful of really great training opportunities throughout the year. Um, and now that we're all used to Zoom, um, you can attend those a lot more easily than we could when folks had to travel to everything. Um, but that would be my recommendation, National Indian Child Welfare Association, and then any training opportunity. Renee, I think that's all the questions. Oh, sorry, Renee, if there's... Nope, that um, you were right on point. Um, we're right at our one hour and Mado and Wado in Cherokee um, to all of you for um, sharing this space with us today and for attending all of our series. And again, Mariana is going to send out great information to link you back to all the webinars all the Q&As, and we will have some follow-up things um, down the road, so be looking for that. Mariana, do you want to close us out? Thank you so much, and a major thank you to Casey and to Renee. Your leadership is so inspiring, and we're just happy to be here to see it. Can I Can I also thank, thank Melanie, you, Melanie on the screen with us? Just amazing <sighs> here for all of this. Melanie, we appreciate <laughs> you so much. Yes, thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.